Hello to all of you joining this LinkedIn live session curated by Thinkers50. And welcome to everyone tuning in via the Zevio streaming platform too. I'm Des Dillard, co-founder of Thinkers50, the world's most reliable resource for identifying, ranking and sharing the leading management ideas of our age. Ideas that we believe can make a real difference in the world. Our belief in the power of ideas has been the foundation of our work since we launched the first ever global ranking of management thinkers in 2001. And we've published a new Thinkers 50 ranking every two years since, and it remains the premier ranking of its kind. So we are excited that 2021, a year in which fresh thinking and human ingenuity are more vital than ever, is also a Thinkers 50 year. Nominations are now open at www.thinkers50 for both the ranking of management thinkers and our Distinguished Achievement Awards, which the Financial Times calls the Oscars of Management Thinking. A um, couple more dates for your calendar are the 15th and 16th of November, when we will be hosting the 2021 Thinkers 50 Awards Gala, with all the excitement of a new ranking and the naming of our 2021 award winners. Our theme I think as 50 2021 is ideas with purpose and our session today couldn't be more appropriate. Hubert Jolie is the former chairman and CEO of the consumer electronics retailer Best Buy. He's been recognized as one of the 100 best performing CEOs in the world by the Harvard Business Review, one of the top 30 CEOs in the world by Barron's and one of the top 10 CEOs in the United States in Glassdoor's annual employees choice awards. Prior to Best Buy, he was the CEO of Carson Companies and worked at Vivendi and EDS. Before that, he was a consultant and partner at McKinsey. Hubert stepped down as chairman of Best Buy in 2020. He is now a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School and serves on the boards of Johnson & Johnson and Ralph Lauren. He's here today to talk about his new book. Written with Caroline Lambert, it's called The Heart of Business, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism. For the next 45 minutes, we're going to be talking about the importance of having a noble purpose and the magic that can happen when you put people and purpose at the heart of a business. Uh, we want to make this session as interactive as possible. So please share where you are tuning in from today and let us know what's on your minds. Please post your questions as we go along. Now, please welcome to the Thinkers 50 virtual stage, Hubert. Thank you, Des, and I very much look forward to our conversation. Yeah, good. I'm, I'm really excited about this one. One of the striking things about the book is that it's not just a turnaround story. You know, it's not just the best buy experience. It's very much a personal leadership journey and, and dare I say, it, a spiritual journey too. So I, I really want to, you know, kind of explore some of that with you. But let's start, as it were, with, with 2012. And you, you get a call from a headhunter in May 2012 asking if you're interested in taking the job of CEO at Best Buy. Tell us, to start us there, please. Well, that's, and the call was for my good friend Jim Citrin, and my answer to him, which is actually the first words in the book, is, Jim, you're crazy, right? I know nothing about retail, and this place is a mess. And this, this was, in a sense, the all-you-can-eat menu of challenges, right? You had strategic challenges with Amazon, supposed to kill us, Apple opening their own stores, Microsoft. You had operational challenges with the quality of service having gone down, leadership challenges with my predecessor having been fired, and then... <laughs> Uh, shareholder challenges with the founder, Dick Schultz, wanted to take the, the company private. But I, I did eventually take the job because Jim told me, no, no, you have to study. This one is for you. They're not looking for a retailer. They, you have turnaround experience. And what I saw at this was that the world needed Best Buy, both the customers and the vendors, and that the problems of Best Buy were essentially self-inflicted. And the good news with self-inflicted problems is <laughs> you don't need to blame anybody for them. You, you can correct them. And, and he did my turnaround and transformation experience. I felt could uh, prepare me well for that uh, job. So I applied. I told them I wanted the job. I told them what I was going to do. And I got the job. Fantastic. So, I mean, you, I mean, remarkably, you managed to turn this, turn this company around. As you said, there were, there were so many potential issues, not least, you know, um, Amazon. I mean, other other retailers in the same line of business have gone out of business. I mean, and you say that the wounds were sort of self-inflicted. So how did you start to put it right? And how did you diagnose the problems? Yeah, so we didn't do the cut, cut, cut approach that many were recommending. You know, the usual formula for turnarounds, close stores in retail, fire a lot of people and announce this and, and then your share price goes up. 
the, the, the what was interesting, and then I'll talk about the how, because that was the beginning of the philosophy that uh, I talk about in the, in the book. And the what was, you know, fix what was broken. So essentially, you know, we, we ensured our prices were competitive. Uh, we matched online uh, prices. We invested in the shopping experience online because that's where the shopping journey starts. We uh, increased the speed of shipping. Now we, we ship as fast as Amazon, you know, same day, next day, for free. We invested in the customer experience in the stores. There's one clever thing we did, which was partner with the world's foremost tech companies that now all have a store within our store, which is good for the customers, good for the vendors, and good for us. We did take some cost out, and then we exited uh, Europe and, and, and China. That's the what. But the more interesting piece is the how. And the how, this was there's a very human-centric turnaround. So even when you're about to die, don't think that people are the problem. People are the solution. So my first week on the job was actually spent working in a store to listen to the frontliners. They knew what was working and what was not working. It was also start with people by making sure we had the right team at the top. I'm a bit of a Maoist, so I, f I believe that fish rot from the head. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also uh, people come last. So in the, in, in the levers you have, I believe in a turnaround, it's first about increasing revenue. It's amazing what you can do with revenue growth. If you're going to cut costs, and of course you have to, we had to cut costs, our cost structure was bloated. Go first after non-salary expenses, which is all of the elements in the cost structure that have nothing to do with people. And there's a lot of waste and inefficiencies at most companies, frankly. And treat headcount reduction as a last resort. And even then, you know, treat employees on the way out if they have to go out as well as you treated them on the way in. And then finally, it's all about creating energy. In physics, we learned that energy is a finite quantity, not in business, not in a human organization. And so in many ways, our role as a leader is, yeah, maybe to help make sure we have, you know, the right strategy. But more importantly, it's to make sure the energy flows. So how do you do this? It's by co-creating the plan as opposed to telling people what to do. It's getting going. It's celebrating the, the early wins. It's talking about the problems. Oh, this is not quite working. Let's get a team together and let's figure it out. So this energy generation piece was a critical. So you can see the philosophy starting to emerge even when we were about to die, supposed to die. <laughs> now, again, I mentioned in the intro that you, you started life at McKinsey. Now, McKinsey aren't known for this kind of um, people-centered, um, you know, I, I, I'm sure they've made progress too, but it doesn't sound like a McKinsey consultant speaking. You've obviously had a journey yourself, a personal sort of journey of, of leadership and, and understanding. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I studied this as a uh, deeply analytical, hard-charging problem solver, all about how do we maximize performance. And now, <laughs> I'm somebody who talks about unleashing human magic and pursuing a noble purpose. So it was several milestones. I think all of us are on a learning journey. And I think if we, uh, in a leadership journey, if we continue learning throughout our life, this, you know, good things happen. There was many milestones. One of them was, you know, being asked by two monks to write an article about the philosophy and the theology of work. Why do we work? Is work a curse? because some dude sings in paradise, or is it something we do so that we can do something else, like watch Chelsea beat uh, uh, Manchester City. If you're, if you're British, that's a big deal, right? Two British teams, English teams. In the it, it is if you're a Chelsea fan, as I am. So it was, it was a very big deal. It was a good day. Good, good for you. Or is work part of our fulfillment as human beings? And I love uh, Khalil Gibran, the Lebanese poet, when he says, work is love made visible. And so that was a game changer. I learned also from a client at McKinsey who told me back in the early 90s, you bet the purpose of a company is not to make money. Profit is a, an imperative, of course. It's really an outcome. But if you step back, it's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal, you know, ethically, uh, metaphysically, is about to do something good in the, in the world. Um, there was other milestones, like including <laughs> working for, with a coach for the first time starting in 2009, the one and only Marshall Goldsmith. Well, so, as you know, Marshall Features has always was featured highly in our ranking over the years. I know, I know. Elevated to our Hall of Fame. But so yeah. what do you want from Marshall? Well, you know, before then, if somebody had told me, you know, Jack or Mary are working with a coach, I would have said, what's wrong with, with them? Are they in trouble? Are they going to be fired? 
And then I realized that when I play tennis, I like to hit with a pro so that I can improve my forehand. Or when I ski, I like to ski with an instructor so that I can improve my skiing in the muggles or in the deep powder. And so maybe I should do the same. And, and when I learned from my head of HR that Marshall was specializing in helping successful leaders get better, this was very appealing. I was flattered a little bit that he would take an interest in me. But the idea of feet forward, that's simply genius. Right? When I got my first 360 from Marshall, uh, he told me, you don't need to do anything about it. It's your decision. What would you like? Is there something you'd like to get better at? That's a completely different mindset. Having, you know, being, you know, motivation is not extrinsic, it's intrinsic. So if we get to decide and then ask for help. And so that was a game changer. So in, 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 uh, in Marshall's infomercials, I am the before and after picture. <laughs> <laughs> most, okay. most improved. Yes. Okay. Now, Marshall's, one of, part of Marshall's genius is the reframing. To, to take something and, and show it to you in a different frame. And I, I, I think the title of, of one of his books, it must be one of the great book titles, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. You almost don't need to read the book. It's all there. It's just in the title. But, yeah, fantastic. And, and, and that's in the 20 quirks of successful people. You list on page 50. I had 13 out of the 20. <laughs> there you go. Um, another thing that I was particularly impressed with with the book is – you connect it all back to this notion of work and how we understand work. So it, it's it's a connected system. It's a connected philosophy in the sense that we have to effectively reframe how we feel about work and how we understand work in order to get the benefits you're talking about. But to be, you know, um, hopefully more fulfilled human beings as well. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, and it's there's a you know tragedy of of uh, unfulfilling work. I think it's Gallup who says that. Uh, less than 20% of employees around the world are, are really engaged. And I remember my first job, you know, I was uh, working in a supermarket when I was 16, putting price tags on pecans. I can tell you I was not, you know, engaged. And now people, companies talk a lot about, you know, pursuing a, a purpose. And, of course, we, that's, the, uh, that's a key element of the philosophy in the book. And then pe but people think then of rolling this out, cascading this down, making sure everybody complies. This top-down approach doesn't work. What's really miraculous yeah. is, ways, is when you can have everyone at the company write themselves into the story. And so I had a store general manager in Boston as, and I, when I was visiting that store because it was one of our you know, well-performing stores. What he was doing was asking every one of the associates in his store a qu simple question. What is your dream at Best Buy or outside of Best Buy? Okay. Write it down in the break room. My job is to help you achieve your dream. And there's many stories in the book about how we, uh, we had associates really deeply understand that what drives them, which is usually for most people, doing good things to others. They could actually find meaning in their job and connect their personal purpose with their job and the purpose of the company. So it's much more an inside out and bottom up approach. You need the top down, you need the strategic piece. But the bottom-up, inside-out piece is so essential because <laughs> let's do a survey on this uh, webinar. <laughs> we won't see the answers, but we can guess them. Raise your hand if you're not driving and if you like to be told what to do. <laughs> Des, do you like to be told what to do? Never. No. No, I think, I think you're right. I think that's a universal. I don't think any of us do, but um, we put up with it. I, I, again, what was interesting when you were telling the story about the, the manager in Boston is – it, it, it sounds sort of um, difficult how you would connect that. But there was, I, I seem to remember there was a story in the book about how he one, one of the one of the employees wanted to own her own apartment. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, it's the, what I love is the, the way these things that can be made concrete. They don't have to be yeah. fluffy. It's yeah. a real this this individual really wanted to own her own apartment, and the manager therefore needed to give her the opportunity to earn a bit more money to, to um, be trained and learn some new skills so that she could, you know, move into a different role where she would eventually be able to, which is what happened, you know. Um, so everything sort of connects up. So that's that's the work side of it. And then part two of the book, you start you start to take a pot shot at, you know, the sort of Milton Friedman view of the world, which, you know, suggests that shareholder value is all. 
Where, where are we with that? What's your point there? Yeah, it's, so if we step back today, it's not difficult to step back, right? It's clear that the world we're in is facing a multifaceted crisis. Of course, there's been the health crisis, there's an economic crisis, societal issues, racial issues, environmental challenges, and of course, geopolitical uh, tension. And uh, on my most wanted FBI list, <laughs> I have two people, Milton Friedman, shareholder of primacy, and Bob McNamara, the inventor of scientific top-down management. I think these two things, in my opinion, this is my opinion, are the root cause of a lot of the problems we have. And there's a chapter in the book, chapter four, where I describe that, you know, how a an excessive pursuit of profit is, is you know, not good, is poisonous, is dangerous, you name it. I think that, uh, and then, of course, what's the definition of madness, right? That's it's doing the same thing and hoping for a different outcome. So I think this is the time to articulate and implement a new philosophy. And my philosophy, my, my uh, thesis in the book is that at the heart of business, you know, business is about pursuing a noble purpose, number one. Number two, putting people at the center and creating an environment where everybody can blossom and where you can unleash human magic. Number three, it's about embracing all stakeholders in, a, in some kind of declaration of interdependence. Business cannot be successful in isolation. And number four, it's about treating profit as an outcome, an important one, but not the ultimate goal. Now, this philosophy, I think most people now are gravitating towards that. Uh, so it's easy to articulate. I think most people agree. The challenge is that it, it forces us, it requires us to rethink so many things, how we think about work, how we think about what is a company. For me, a company is a human organization made of individuals working together in pursuit of a goal. And if, the, if our goal as individual is, is not just money, it's then the purpose of a company has got to be to make a positive difference in the world, to, 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 you know, to be a force for good. It's the idea of doing well by doing good. And it requires us to rethink how we motivate and mobilize. You know, the top-down approach doesn't work. So we talk about, you know, the ingredients that are necessary. I'm French, right? So I talk about a recipe uh, to unleash human magic. And it requires us to rethink how we lead. I think the model of the leader as the superhero who knows everything and is uh, driven by his own ego or power, fame, glory, or money, eh, nobody wants to be led by somebody like this. Yeah. Plus, it doesn't work in this very uncertain world. That doesn't work. So that's uh, that's really the philosophy. I think there's still that trade-off. You know, during during the pandemic, we've seen it where where people do crave certainty. They crave, even though certainty is is, is an illusion. I think. Yeah. You know, I think we're beginning to understand that, and perhaps, yeah. perhaps with people are becoming a bit more adult to adult and understanding that about their leaders. But the leaders that have shone for me as we've come through the crisis have been the ones who've been prepared to say, "I don't necessarily know what's going to happen next, yeah. but, but I will work with you and do my very best to be transparent and prepare us for whatever eventuality we happen to face." I think this, yeah, we saw such amazing leadership during the the, the crisis. I know my successor as the CEO of Best Buy, Corey Barry. You know, was just extraordinary, and yeah, she was vulnerable. She was able to say, "I don't know." She was able to look for advice. A very important thing: she was driven by principles. And one of the things we had worked on at Best Buy is making sure that as leaders, we, we we are clear about our purpose as leaders and how we want to be remembered. What guides us? So she she outlined a few principles. Number one, we're going to focus on the safety of our employees and our customers. Number two, we were going to delay as long as humanly possible, any layoff or any following. Uh, and number three, we wanted to come out of this crisis as strong as possible. Note that she didn't say, and we want to hit our quarterly guidance. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is these principles come deep inside her because what drives her is stewardship. And then she laid out these principles that enabled her to empower other people at the company closer to the ground for example, to decide which stores to close when based on local circumstances. And of course, you know, this was a, a time so to lead from a place of purpose and principles, but also with great humanity. And I think we all discovered or rediscovered that our employees are human beings, right? We now know where they live. We know their, their spouse or partner, their children, their dogs, their cat, their Wi-Fi problems. And and this, there's no going back, right? Uh, once we've discovered that uh, the employees, my, my CFO is not just a CFO, she's a human being, or my store general manager 
there's no going back. So I think it's a, we have the opportunity to pivot to a better system that uh, hopefully can create something that's uh, more sustainable and better than what we've had uh, in the last 40 years. I, I guess the shocking, shocking thing is that we, we didn't realize that people were human beings you know, before. But anyway, we'll leave that to one side. Alex, uh, Alexandra from, um, I think she's joining us from Denmark, Poland. She's saying, yeah, we're only just beginning to realize that people matter. Perhaps that's what we've learned from the, from the COVID crisis. Or did, yeah. Can you see the question? Did companies realize that to fulfill their obligations to the stakeholders, they actually need people? When they're not doing well, they cannot do their jobs. I think that, Alexandra, you're, you're spot on. It's, it's, it's tragic that we're saying this, right? And the truth is many companies have been saying that people was their most important asset, but the dominant theory was profit was what we were here for. Now, the, the, the more advanced leaders knew that having great you know, people, prop, properly motivated and skilled, you know, was, uh, was a key driver to a great outcome. But I think we've gone one step beyond. I think that there was a bit, in my experience, so everybody has had a different experience, there was a tendency to see workers sometimes at the extreme as the problem. So that's the cut, cut, cut approach, but also sometimes as just employees. So they were here to perform a function. Uh, and of course, we knew they were human. There was no doubt. But I think we've gone uh, we've gone one step beyond, and we need to go one step beyond. We need to see the whole person, uh, and and you know the 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 rising awareness of mental uh, health issues, for example, is a sign that we're now talking about these things. Scammy Scarlett, a head of HR at Best Buy, one day shared that uh, for years she had been struggling with depression. Mm. Not many C-suite uh, executives of large companies would have done that. And I think the implication of that is that because it's, you know, facts are facts, but then you look at the implications, is that as leaders, we need to lead with our, all of our body parts, not just the brain, which was the primary emphasis historically, at least in my experience, but also the heart, the soul, the guts, the ears, the eyes. And what's exciting is that I think we're seeing this evolution happen, um, and it's, it's a matter of, of moving in that uh, direction. So I'm excited by the direction we can be heading uh, towards. Um, Alexandra also makes the point about business schools and what business schools have traditionally yeah. taught. Now, I know that you are now, you know, you are now practicing the noble art of teaching in business schools at, at Harvard. But I mean, and I, and I also noticed that Jeff Bezos himself of, of Amazon said, you know, Best Buy should be the case study taught in business school. So hopefully that's what you're doing. But what, when you went to business school, did you, you, you weren't taught to these sorts of human-centered um yeah, in my, my, my sense, uh, and Alexandra, thank you for highlighting this, is that uh, business education historically has been too focused uh, and too exclusively focused on learning techniques, right? Uh, and my view is that the best leaders are not the best leaders because they are the best at spelling out the four Ps of marketing or calculating a net present value. So the no is important, in the no do be, the no is important, but I felt that we need to shift the mix from techniques to leadership, which is why in 2018, I endowed with my foundation, I endowed a chair on purposeful leadership at HEC in Paris. And that's why I joined the, the faculty at Harvard because I, I wanted to join with others. I'm obviously not the only one, right? But add my voice and my energy to um, this necessary and urgent foundation of, of business. And I'm working with uh, you know, two great colleagues on, on designing a course both in executive education and for the MBA program, that's been inspired by these principles. Because my, here's my sense, Des. Again, most people are, are now believe, you know, convinced that this is the right direction. And all of us are travelers on this journey. And we know this is hard. And so the book, and you know, what I wanted to share is a video guide uh, for leaders at all levels, by the way. It's not just CEOs. It can be a store, a store supervisor, right, who are keen to let go of the old ways and to, do, to learn how to become our best at unleashing human magic, really put it, what does it really mean to put people at the center? What does it really mean to embrace all stakeholders? And I feel like maybe that there's much to be invented. Uh, and I was uh, excited to be able to share because the, the Best Buy turnaround and the fact that the share price went from $11 in, in, at the low in 2012 to now between 110 and 120 gives credibility, some credibility 
to what I have to share. People are not going to ask, what, what were you smoking? Was that legal? Or, oh my. <laughs> it actually works. <laughs> Do you think, I mean, that the, I'm going to stay with, you, with the subtitle of the book as well, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism. We, we're obviously, we hope, I think we all hope that we're moving into a, a new era. Um, what, what characterizes that, that phase of capitalism and, and, and what specifically are the new leadership um, qualities that people need? Well, if I, if I focus on the, uh, on, on, the, on the CEO and then I'll broaden it, uh, I think the, the, the role of CEO, the, ro the role of senior executives has changed fundamentally. The mission has changed. It used to be shareholder value maximization. Now it's about being a force for good in the world and pursuing a noble purpose. The scope has changed. It used to be essentially the four walls of the business. And by the way, gap accounting or IFRS, as I feel the same, um, it's all about the four walls. It doesn't account for externalities, right? I mean, it, and so now, you know, if you, Best Buy is based in Minneapolis, right? So after the horrible murder of George Floyd, if the city's on fire, you know you cannot open your stores, mm -hmm. right? Or if the planet is on fire, as my colleague uh, Rebecca Anderson, you know, uh, writes about, you know, this is the business business risk uh, you have. So you have to embrace all stakeholders, not as a, an afterthought, but as a core part of your business. And then, you know, the leadership model has changed. It's, I think the leadership model for the future is a purposeful leader who is very clear about what drives them and how they want to be remembered and hopefully you know, making a positive difference uh, in the world. And they're curious about the purpose of people uh, around them. Uh, and then they are, they're clear that they're not here to serve themselves, but to clear to serve, you know, people around them. They're, they're clear they're not here to be the smartest person in the room, but to create an environment where others can be successful. And then they're, they're really authentic and they're okay to be vulnerable and say, my name is Hubert, I don't know and I need help. And I am not angry that I don't know, and and I appreciate you know, that we're all human beings, right? Here's the scoop. On the team, we have these imperfect, non-standard you know, beings that are called humans. And the beauty is that uh, it's by being vulnerable and supporting each other that we can create you know, the, best, uh, the best outcome. A couple of times you've used the phrase force for good, and we, we, we talk about noble purpose, but if, if it's easy to think that means we should all, you know, run away and, and, and work for, you know, not for profits. You're not actually saying that. A, oh, a, no. business, a profitable business can have a noble purpose. Give us, can you talk us through how Best Buy realized, because they, obviously you, you had to address that and, and come up with a noble purpose. Yeah, yeah, this was a game changer for us. Uh, and you're right, it's not just for nonprofits, it's not just in the healthcare, I mean, on the board of J&J, &J, and that's a very purposeful organization, yeah. but... I think this, the, the, the opportunities for every organization to think about it. So Best Buy, uh, uh, once we had saved the, 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 the company and we wanted to see how we could accelerate our growth, you know, we, we slowed down, we did some strategy work, on segmentation, targeting, positioning. But we also asked ourselves, who, who are we and who do we want to be? And at that time, I actually said, we're not a retailer. We're not a consumer electronics retailer. We may look like one or smell like one, but we're not. We're a company, a human organization that's here to enrich lives through technology by addressing key human needs. And of course, it was translated into very specific strategies, and, and you know, we, we work hard to make sure that it was meaningful for everybody. But what it does, if you do this, is that, uh, of course, it's more inspiring, but also from a business standpoint, it vastly expands your addressable market. Uh, and so as example, two quick examples, is this is how we got into the health space, helping aging seniors stay in their home and live in their home longer independently by putting sensors under their bed and under the sofa, in the kitchen, the bathroom, fall detection. And with AI and remote monitoring and care centers, you know, we can, uh, many of us have aging parents, right? So we know what, what I'm talking about. We can make sure that we can detect so if something is going bad and and then trigger an intervention. We would never have thought about this if we had thought about ourselves as a, as a retailer. Similarly, uh, if, if your technology need is a bit complex, maybe you're redoing your family room. And in, the, in the US, the family room where the big TV is, that's a big deal, right, it's to watch the Super Bowl. Uh, and so it's hard to have the conversation in the store or online. So we'll come to you. 
And we have this in-home advisor program. It's a bit like a designer. Mm-hmm. And uh, for free, we'll come to you. We'll have the conversation. We'll design a solution. And our aspiration is to gain your trust so that we become the CIO, your CTO for your home. It's a completely different value proposition, yeah. truly addressing a human need, right? Because the stuff, let's agree, the stuff is complex. And so it unleashes potential uh, and it does good things in the in, in, in the world. Now, of course, many companies are writing down their purpose. The challenge is, you know, go through the steps of what it takes to make it real and, and meaningful for, for a large organization. That's That's where the work is. I mean, again, what I find fascinating about it is that, to me, it's got it's got an echo of Ted Levitt's piece, you know, Marketing Myopia in the Harvard Business Review, where he said, you know, the trouble with the railway companies thought they were in the railway business, yeah. and the yeah. car companies thought they were in the making cars business, and, and they weren't. They were in the transportation business, getting mm-hmm. people from one place to another. So, in a way, that that hugely expands your market, and this mm-hmm. is... This seems to me be, I have a parallel because it, it makes it makes the space bigger, it makes the markets bigger. It, it's less, you know, it's reframing again. Back to reframing. And as we exit the the COVID pandemic, this is this thinking is essential because many companies, some companies have greatly benefited, but others, for others, it's much harder. And so, if you're a hospital system or a restaurant company, uh, thinking about yourself as a brick and mortar operation is very limiting. So. Not far from Minneapolis, we have uh, Mayo Clinic, which is one of the world's foremost, you know, health institution. With technology and digital surgery and, you know, telemedicine, they can, and if they focus on saying, we're actually a health and wellness organization, oh, my God, the, the possibilities using technology and human ingenuity are limitless. And so I think it's going to be, you know, there's an imperative as we exit this crisis to reimagine what your business is about. And reimagining it with an anchor around a noble purpose, I think, is is a, it can be a game changer. The other thing that's, we, we, you know, I know this, everybody knows this, employees are demanding that companies be a force for good. Customers are demanding this. Shareholders, I mean, look at how Larry Fink and, and State Street and Vanguard are writing to all of us, you know, boards and, and CEOs of, of companies on on how to pursue a purpose, long-term strategy, our responsibilities in the, in the world. And then the community is, is demanding it and needs it, right? Back to my Minneapolis story, you know, business, there's a lot of large companies headquartered in Minneapolis. We, we're engaged in trying to create a better future for, for Minneapolis and Minnesota. Do you, one of, one of um, our radar thinkers from a couple of years ago, one of the things, which one of the things is, is, a, is a very smart um, lady called um, Megan Reitz. She's doing work at the moment looking at employee um, activism. Yes. Do you, do you see that coming through? I mean, it, it seems to be, again, it's, I take it as a positive sign. What's fascinating is that, so we've had for the last several years, the rise of shareholder activism. What we're seeing now is the rise of stakeholder activism. It's the employees, it's the customers, uh, it's the shareholders or the NGOs. You've seen what happened at ExxonMobil and Total in France around, say, on you know the, the climate change and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so you you're seeing these different groups express their views. And so that makes, by the way, the life of CEOs and boards a little bit more complex. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the reality. Uh, and um, it, it comes with some pain because some, t- you know, in the U.S., uh, you've seen a trend where CEOs and companies have had to take positions on a number of societal issues. Uh, you're now getting hate mail uh, because you've taken a position on, on, or you're doing something. Forget about taking a position; you're doing something or, or this on that. Uh, so I think that's it's it's this idea that we have to embrace all of these stakeholders and. And, and then we can, you know, we have options, right? There's, we can decide to complain. Oh, my God, this is not fair, right? <laughs> or this is too hard. Or we can embrace this and say, let's try to deeply understand the messages we're getting from these stakeholders. And let's try to create. And I see that on the board of Ralph Lauren, right? So uh, the apparel industry is one of the world's biggest polluters, right? It's, it's, uh, it's one of them. There's, there's others. Mm-hmm. And, of course, uh, uh, apparel has to do also with society. So it's. Interesting to see the design, the change. Of course, Ralph is a designer. The design, the change strategy that they're employing, where they're looking at, uh, uh, you know, designing for different minorities, different body shapes, 
but also incorporating sustainability and the circular economy, for, you know, from day zero into their strategy. So I think the leaders, you know, <laughs> COVID is a little bit like uh, 66 million years ago when planet Earth was hit by an asteroid, yeah. the dinosaurs died, but new species emerged. And so I think this is the time where there can be a lot of innovation and great leadership. That doesn't make it easy, but I think that it creates opportunities. Yeah. Um, please do, if you've got questions for Hubert, we're very fortunate to have him with us for another 10 minutes or so. So please put your questions into the um, into the comments if, if you have questions. Meanwhile, I'm just going to monopolize this time and ask him all the questions I want to ask him. <laughs> so, um, this is the thing of Smith. I have to ask you, we've mentioned Marshall Goldsmith, and you know, I, we talked about a couple of other um, thinkers. Um, do you read business and management books? Is it is it something as a, as a CEO that, that you kept in touch with? And who are your kind of thinkers of choice? I love I love reading. It's a it's such a treat uh, to be able. To, in fact, my biggest luxury in in life is to be able to sit for a few hours with a great uh, with a great book. So I'm currently reading Adam Grant's you know a great book. Uh, of course, he's he's an amazing thinker. I have noise on my uh, list. Because a good friend of mine is the co-writer of this, Olivier Siboni. We were at McKinsey together, so uh, love that. I've always been inspired by, of course, you, know, you quoted Marshall. So I think Marshall has had some wonderful book, uh, including What Got You Here and What Get You There, as well as Triggers. He's written a good one on succession as well. So he gave it to me when I was starting to think about this. Bill George has written some great classics. I think uh, Discover Your True North. Uh, has been out now in different iterations for maybe 15 years. And it's a, it's really an evergreen. Um, so I think that the reason why I read these books is that we constantly need to learn, right? I mean, the, the idea that we would be done learning, you know, when we graduate, that's crazy. The world's keep the world keeps changing. So I keep reading, I keep listening. You know, Satya Nadella is somebody I really look up to, the CEO of Microsoft. I think he really embodies, and, and his performance has been set up, and he embodies a very human, uh, humble leadership model. Um, of course, Alex Gorski, I'm on his board at J&J, uh, at the Business Roundtable, is the guy who chaired the committee that uh, framed this revised corporate purpose that came out in August of 2019. So I'm like a sponge test, you know. And of course, you have to filter, but you know, you have to be open to influences and rethinking. I, I love Adam Grant's book. I think it's a, it's just a treat. <laughs> okay. um, talking of rethinking, a good question come in. Um, if you were back at McKinsey, what would you dif do differently with your clients, knowing what you know now? Oh, and I think they're doing it. I've had uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, speak with, you know, they, they have a number of groups I'm going to mispronounce. Is it Akin that uh, they have? I mean, they, they mispronounce their, their name. That's really focus on this stuff. <laughs> Uh, it's a small group that they uh, recently acquired. Um, I think the anchoring in purpose, I think, is a game changer. Now, whether as a McKinsey consultant I would be helping them with that, I don't know, maybe, and they're, they're doing work in this area. But the other thing is, uh, you know, when the world – so McKinsey it would be there, we would do strategy, and then it would be implementation. And implementation sounded like we're going to tell everybody what to do. I think that the notion of, no, that's not how it works, and and again, the McKinsey of today is very different uh, from the McKinsey that I left in 1996. You know, this idea of creating the environment and involving, uh, you know, the organization in creating the, ch the, the future and the change. That's really uh, – so, in fact, in the book, I actually say that so much of what I learned at business school and at McKinsey in my early years as an executive is either wrong dated or incomplete. And I don't think I'm the only one. Uh, and so, but, uh, the, the, you know, McKinsey and other firms have, uh, have of course, evolved. You know, they're not stupid. They're like us. They're seeing the, the, same, the same stuff. But it's a sea change. And so the implication is that we need to rewire. As leaders, we need to rewire ourselves to be able to lead in, the, in this new era. Another question for you. I... Um, working through Erin Meyer, another person who came through the Thinkers 50 radar and is now in the ranking. Um, she wrote the, um, the culture map. And that led, um, that got the attention of Reed Hastings from Netflix. 
And so she's now written a book with Reed um, looking at the Netflix culture. And I was lucky enough to spend a couple of days with him. And he's a very thoughtful CEO, um, you know, sort of a, with a techie background, but really beginning to think about some of the same things we've been talking about. But one of the things he was very clear on, Reed said, you know, what works at Netflix won't necessarily work in all sectors. We're in the creative, in, we're, we're a creative industry. You know, this isn't necessarily going to work in other places. Your philosophy seems a bit more universal. Would you would you say we're working in any business or, or are there limits to it? The, the fundamentals of the philosophy, I believe, are quite universal, even in the tech sector, because the philosophy I laid out is again, purposeful. It's about purpose and humanity. A tech company is powered by human beings, right? So let's be, let's be clear. Having said that, so I think it's universal, but having said that, business leadership is not about copying. It could have been, it could have been tempting when I was the CEO of Best Buy, and I was tempted to, of course, understand what Amazon was doing and to try to copy. And we did neutralize them. You know, we make sure we had the same prices, same great shopping experience online, same speed of shipping. So in soccer terms, we would call this, uh, you know, one one or you know whatever. Yeah. It's a draw. But then we really focused on becoming the best version of Best Buy we could become, because you know competition. I think if my colleague Michael Porter was here, would say, well, it's about creating your unique space, right? Create a moat, create a, a, a truly defendable competitive advantage. And if you're going to compete head on with Amazon, guess what? You're going to lose. So. Um, people sometimes are afraid of competition or they see competition as a zero-sum game. So other than the COVID pandemic, another pandemic is zero-sum games. It's a disease, right? The zero-sum game is the only way for this webinar that's to be great is if you win and I lose. That's crazy. <laughs> we need to collaborate. and We're doing a great job, I hope. Uh, and, and so with Amazon, we actually ended up partnering with them. Uh, in, in unique ways. But the main focus was what is the best version of ourselves we can become and really addressing these human needs in a unique way and defendable way. And so that's the uh, that's where I might be read as something that you know, it's about human beings. You know, don't try to be uh, somebody else. Everybody else is already taken. So why don't you try to be you, you know? <laughs> the best, beautiful, biggest version of yourself, but yeah. try to be leverage your own genius but back to the authenticity piece as well back to bill george it all it all sort of comes together yeah. Some, something else that, that struck me is that very few you, you mentioned succession planning earlier yeah. um, you know uh, marshall's book and in general but very few in my experience very few very successful leaders manage their own exits well um but you seem to have been you know one of, one of your great achievements seems to have been making yourself dispensable Yes. Um, how did that come about? And talk us through that process. Oh, it's, so, it's so interesting because, yes, succession planning is so important. And yet it's a field where there's actually surprisingly little that has been written. And, and of course, when the time comes, you've had little experience, right, uh, yeah. of, of passing the baton the last time. Here's what I learned. Uh, in 2016, of course, with our board, you know, every quarter, every year, we would talk about this. But I felt that succession planning was the wrong focus. Right, because you don't know when the event is going to happen, and two, it's a zero-sum game. Again, only one person is going to get the job, so it's a it's a horse race. It's it's just terrible. So we I rethought we rethought this and said let's focus on executive development, self included, and so we gave every one of the executive team members, not just those who had the potential to be CEO, an executive leadership coach. That leadership coach also helped us work on our effectiveness as a team. We all got 360s. And I completely flipped, by the way, the, the, the dreaded, you know, uh, semi-annual performance review. Remember where some, your boss tells you these are three things you, you did well and three things you didn't do so well? Oh, my God. Now, at the end, it was the executive. And again, with the, the help of a coach and the 360, would come to me and say, these are the things that I think went well that I'm proud of. These are things where, you know, I think we can do better. These are my goals, so feed forward for the next six months, both from a business standpoint, but also from a personal development standpoint. This is what I'm planning to do to get better. Uh, and my role in that meeting was to tell them, 
look, I think you're shortchanging yourself. I think you're better than what you're just describing. And B, ask them a question. How can it be helpful? So it was, and then what that led to is, uh, this is everybody getting better. So creating a great growth mindset uh, to quote call, call Carol Dweck. Uh, and, um, you know, a couple of leaders really emerging. And as a CEO, what you want is, is options. So then there was a time where I felt, you know, the time had come for me to uh, pass the baton for a variety of reasons. We had great candidates. Uh, one of the nuances, by the way, to keep in mind, and Sally Hedgerson in her great book, How Woman Rise, talks about it. If, and I'll finish with this. If a boy is 80% ready for a promotion, right, we'll tend to say, oh, we got it. We are ready. If a woman is 125% ready for a promotion, most of the time women will say, tend to say, I'm not sure I'm ready. I'm not sure I finished what I want, what I was doing. I'm not sure I want the, the limelight and so forth. So as leaders, sometimes we have to put our thumb on the scale to even the playing field from that standpoint. I'm very proud that my successor is a woman, Cory Barry, that when I stepped down, the majority of the board was, were women and that we had three uh, black uh, African-American directors and a, altogether a wonderful uh, board for the, for the company. So it's not about succession planning. It's about executive development. Okay, very good. And, and finally, we are, as you know, out of time, but, but just something very quickly about LQ versus IQ. We were talking about it before we came on. Yeah, so we've all been focused on IQ and EQ. I give credit to Clark Murphy, the, the CEO of Russell Reynolds, who was sharing with me. I don't know whether he invented it or he just shared it. The importance of LQ, learning quotient, in this very unpredictable world where there's no playbook for anything we're facing with. Being an, a, a leader who is able to say, this is what I know, this is what I don't know, I'm going to look for help, I think is a wonderful mindset. So go LQ. Fantastic. We're out of time. The Heart of Business Leadership Principles for the next era of capitalism is published by HBR Press, and it's out now, and I thoroughly recommend it. Thank you for tuning in, and please join us next time for more Fresh Thinking with Thinkers 50. Hubert, fantastic. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. That, that was terrific. Thank you.